Hello everyone, this is Rajeshi Sengupta and we are in the second installment of our week on embroidered narratives. So we have so far looked into some of the basics of embroidery and then what kind of effects the embroidery creates. Now the other kind of embroidery what we have not discussed so far is this idea of applique or adding a piece of fabric on the top of a fabric and then embroidering it around it or like I mean uh, adding embroidery to like I mean sort of make this piece of fabric as part of the already existing fabric. So for example this cut uh, embroidery or like I mean the cut quilt technique that 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 we find it there and it it's there in some parts of like I mean uh, in India uh, and mostly we find it in Western India also in part of Northern Karnataka and so on and one of those things what we can see here this so for example this technique which is called katab and that comes up and in which we see these fabrics are already cut in pieces so for example the one we see in the left side of the screen upper left and then this cut fabrics are then added on the top of a pre-existing fabric and then stitched with it. So for that what happens is that we see how this of course it gives a different effect to the entire fabric itself and for the shadow of the fabric that is added on the top of it its three dimensionality always remains there however it still remains like I mean as a fabric so that I mean it kind of like it in one layer of the fabric almost. So that is how we see that this applique technique that adds a different kind of meaning to the fabric altogether. And then when we see something like this Athri quilt in which we find that many other colors are also used with this kind of quilt making and then it's not just like the cut pieces of the fabric and usually this kind of quilts are made from like used fabric so for example a used fabric of different color those will be like I mean made into those small pieces to avoid the areas which are affected and then like I mean they will be sort of made into this way of arranging the this pieces they would be stitched into the pre-existing fabric and then made into this kind of quilts. So this technique is definitely about reusing fabric and with this what happens that as I have already mentioned that I mean if clothes are getting torn down and they are almost at the verge of being unusable then like I mean embroidery comes as a rescue and then this way the clothes can be sort of made into a new form of fabric which can be used again. So of course that I mean if someone is using a sari or a shirt or dhoti or whatever it is then they won't be able to like I mean wear that cloth the same way if the pieces of the sari is then made into this quilt but then the quilt will be used in a different purpose altogether. So this shift in the usage is also something we find that I mean how that is also related to shift in its cultural value. So when this is sari, when this is a regular wearable fabric then it has different kind of purpose but when it becomes a quilt and the quilt also requires a tremendous amount of time and effort and everything else and labor. So if those things are involved in that and that's the reason we find that the quilts are something that is used for much longer time because it is much more sturdy because of the layers and also that I mean sometimes we find different kinds of quilts are given as gifts or dowry during marriage or different other kind of occasions which hold much relevance for uh, family and community lives. Now let us look into the themes that we are supposed to discuss as part of this week's lecture and we'll start the discussion with the embroidered shawls of Kashmir and allied practices. So as I have already mentioned that the Kashmir shawls there are the woven shawls with like I mean uh, twill weaving and tapestry twill and so on. So in this case we are not really talking about those woven shawls but we are talking about embroidered shawls. Now let us just get few things clear that when I talk about like I mean the twill weaving then what do I mean by that. So in twill weaving as like textile scholar Janet Rizvi has uh, noted that for the Kashmir shawls what happens we see this twill weaving is something that is preferred more than the regular plain weave in which we see that the warp 
and the whiff that that sort of like I mean runs um, you know in right angle with each other. But for twill weaving what happens there are two warps and then like two webs sort of like I mean passes under them and over that and that is how what happens that I mean in case of like one one another we find like two and then like two here to there and that is how like I mean this diagonal motif is we find that to have created which does not really come in the regular plane wave and for its orientation we also find that I mean what also Janet Resby has noted that for this kind of orientation in which like I mean the flow of this two weave as we see that I mean something that is going above it the web threads two web threads will be going on the top of the warp thread and then two will be going underneath the warp thread that is the construction it also gives the fabric much more elasticity to certain extent and that is the reason we find that I mean this kind of fabrics are much more soft and flexible when those are sort of like I mean wrapped around the body and that is the reason that this highly prized pashmina shawls we find them to be much more uh, softer on the skin and they are much more comfortable when those, those are those are worn so these are the kind of like I mean some of the basics we find that to be there in the plain woven Kashmir shawls and on the top of that we see how the embroidery is added on the top of it for whatever purpose they need to serve so in this case what happens we see that this kind of embroidered shawl that I have already mentioned that which started coming on the surface at least from the 18th century. So a number of this kind of shawls were created. Now even though in the when I was talking about the Kashmir shawls I have mentioned that how this kind of twill weaving that makes those shawls much more comfortable when on the wearer's body but this embroidered shawls were certainly not meant to be used on someone's body but they were meant to be perhaps displayed and they were meant for gift. So in this case what see a number of this kind of shawls were created in like 18th century in the 19th century some of them are there in of course we find few of them in the Victoria and Albert Museum in, in London few of the other museum collection in London and Western Europe then the National Gallery in Australia and of course in the uh, Sri Pratap Singh Museum in Srinagar. So all those different museum collections have some of those embroidered shawls. And what do these embroidered shawls display? So in this shawl we see that I mean there is a combination of chain stitch, kani stitch which is very characteristic in Kashmir and, and then um, also like I mean sometimes we see the satin stitch as well and, and all those stitches are used for meticulously making this, this maps on, on, on the shawl surface. And predominantly we find these shawls to be squarish and and sometimes it can be slightly rectangular but like I mean in this case also we find it like I mean squarish and it has uh, this this uh, uh, border and this this border is also that that is not really outside of the of the narrative that is depicted in the center of the shawl but it also sort of like I mean involves those narrative elements and it sort of continues all across in the margins of this shawl. And in the center of the shawl what we see it's a map of Srinagar, the city of Srinagar but like I mean also it sort of shows direction of the different Parganas or the district or the Khazbas or the towns and like the settlements. So those we see and in the center we find that this is the river Jhelum and Jhelum and then like I mean all the canals of the tributaries that we see it kind of like I mean uh, separates from the main source and it sort of like I mean flows through the different parts of the city of Srinagar and we see how the part of Srinagar like I mean this part is certainly given much prominence and how certain parts of Srinagar are like made as this more populated areas whereas like I mean the other parts are shown much more sort of like I mean with the housing and everything distributed in the landscape. Now with this water like I mean the flow of the river that we see which almost sort of like divides the shawl in this two halves like I mean these two diagonal halves almost that it divides. In the upper half we find that I mean part of Dull Lake 
and dull lake or dull jhil is something we all also see that i mean how that is very important part of the landscape of the city of srinagar even today so we see the dull lake and numerous boats which are flowing in the lake as well as in the river and then we see all the settlements around it and then on the top layer we find that i mean this part it is also very interesting in which we see that there are those two famed mughal gardens that is shalimar bag and nishad bag those two gardens are then depicted there and then the rocks or the rocky landscape around them is also depicted with various colors so all these different kind of colors like i mean green yellow blue and so on those are used for emphasizing the rocky landscape there so we see that i mean as rosemary krill had also written about this shawl she says that i mean how even though the shawl sort of like i mean shows the narrative vertically so we might just think that since it's a map so it might have a northern orientation because like north south if this works out in this way because like i mean the story certainly like i mean requires the viewer to see it vertically and not in any other way around however if we think about the location of nishad bag and shalimar bag in the city of uh, srinagar we see that they are actually situated towards the east of the city so the north that we see here in the shawl is actually east so it's a east west orientation but like in the depiction we see that i mean how the east had become north so this kind of changes we see that i mean certainly if there are particular kind of like i mean aspirations those were there being the driving force of making this decision we find that there are certain kind of change and amendments those are made by the makers of this shawl for whatever reason we do not know much about the context of making this shawls but this kind of differences or this kind of information that certainly make us think that there must have been much more thought process involved been making this kind of shawls there now some of the issues as we have already mentioned that how when we think about the shawls so what kind of like i mean aspects we need to consider or like what kind of like i mean other allied practices we need to consider so one of the closest visual practice that we find with the shawls uh, would be the miniature painting tradition and miniature painting that we know as it has also flourished in the 18th century i mean of course there were like i mean miniature paintings before that in the pahari region and by pahari region i mean the punjab hills part of kashmir like jammu and so on and then mostly today's himachal pradesh the state of india and in this cases what we see in the pahari miniature paintings a lot of times we see this bird's eye point of view or the multiple perspectival views which are added in the paintings in which we see almost this map like view in which many events are happening simultaneously or there is a narrative flow that something is happening in one part of the image and then like i mean the same narrative is continuing in the other part of the image as well so those kind of tendencies we find that to be there in the map shawl as well now in the map shawl as we see that i mean until 18th century and so on mostly there are those quilt tapestry woven uh, shawls we find and also like i mean using extra weft and so on so all those shawls in which we find that how pashmina wool is used for making the warp and the weft at the same time we see the dyed wool or silk threads are used for uh, making the extra weft weaving on the shawl so as janet rizvi also mentions that how this one particular embroider and she refers to this european traveler and chronicler moor crops chronicle in which it comes up there was this one particular shawl maker ali baba who started using embroidery in one shawl and after it became after it gave him satisfaction he started doing embroidery all over on the shawl and that is how perhaps like i mean this the entire shawl making tradition started now this is one story and we do not really know that i mean whether this is the only beginning of this embroidered shawl or if there are other sources for starting this kind of embroidered endeavors now let us come back to like the miniature paintings if we see that i mean what kind of like this similarities and differences we can see there so 
This is a miniature painting in the left side of the screen that we have and that comes from painter Manaku and who was a son of Pandit Seu and he was, Manaku was also brother of this famed painter Nansuk. So we see that I mean in this tradition of painting and he was from Guler, we find him to be based in Vasholi as well and so in his work we find that I mean this kind of like I mean this narrative progression, we see them to be there very much. So in this particular image what we see here, it's, a, it's there are those two demon spies, we find them them to be there and here we find this the golden lanka and which is shown here as this fortified city or like i mean this fort complex that we have here which is distinctive from like i mean the forest landscape that we see in the right side of the image and in this golden lanka we see the image of ravana who is instructing these two demons and we find these two demons or perhaps like I mean they are almost arriving. So and what happens in this case that in the right side of the image we see there is this small ground which is surrounded by rocks and then like I mean these mountains and of course like I mean here are all those vanaras or like I mean the monkeys which who are all like I mean part of like Rama's army and Rama and Lakshmana we find them to be there at the center stage. And here we see that the these two spies are there in front of Rama and Lakshmana. So Rama and Lakshmana meet them and then they release these two spies and then they arrive in this golden Lanka and then they go to Ravana here. So there is this narrative progression that what I was talking about in this case and here we also see that the idea of the ocean that is depicted with water and it is not just this one miniature painting in which we will find the use of water. Since the Pahari region is something that is completely cut off from the ocean and it is landlocked and that's the reason what we see that I mean a lot of times the depiction of the river becomes metaphor of endless flow of water and uh, that is the reason we also see that I mean the rivers the way those are been shown in this Pahari miniatures sometimes this torrential turbulent rivers we find and it's not just about showing the water that is flowing on the on the um, you know through through this landscape but it is also something to do with like I mean the turbulence in life the flow of life and I would extend that to say that I mean that also something that is related to the flow of a narrative which is which is very much there as part of like the narrative progression in the miniature paintings. So for example if we see this miniature painting and start from like either this side or from here like I mean we will get to when we sort of like I mean see the same characters being repeated in this part, this part and this part we know that I mean there is a progression that is happening looking at their directionality and then like I mean also comparing them to the textual narrative of Ramayana one can understand that I mean how this narrative is progressing so far. So that flow of the narrative as we already see that in the miniature painting that comes out very prominently is something that is run simultaneously with the flow of the river. And this is this idea that we see that to be there in the map shawl as well that the river which sort of cut across this entire shawl and make it into this diagonal halves is not incidental. It perhaps it seems like a it's a conscious decision to sort of like come I and grab the viewers attention to make people think that how the river and the other uh, like I mean these tributaries and the canals and eventually its connection to the dull jhil all of these things are the lifeline of the city of Srinagar and all the narratives are built around that and that is the reason why we see that uh, this river plays such an important role in depiction of the city here on the shawl. So in this case when we sort of compare the miniature paintings with the shawl the map shawl, this embroidered map shawl, we do not try to understand that I mean this kind of images are used in the miniature and the same kind of images are used in the shawl and so on. But we try to see that I mean what kind of motifs are used, what kind of like flow of the narrative is there and then also in terms of like I mean some of those 
predominant elements in this images. So for example, the flow of the water or flow of the river is something that we find in the miniature paintings as well as in the map shawl. So those are the kind of like underlying um, uh, similarities that we can see between these two practices and why we can understand them as allied practices. Now the third aspect, I mean the second aspect will probably be depiction of architecture. And architecture is something we on and off talk about in this entire course. So in this particular section that we have and of course like in the map shawl we find that there are occasional writings and those would indicate like I mean which part of the city one is looking at or like which Pargana or like I mean which Kasba and places that one is looking into. So those things we see and in this particular part of this shawl we find this famed Jama Masjid that is depicted. And the Jama Masjid here we almost see it to be there depicted like the square shape with like the central projections. And why this particular kind of like depiction is there if we consider it with like the actual architectural complex of the Jama Masjid in Srinagar then we can understand that why this kind of decisions were made. So we see this Jama Masjid complex is also predominantly square and then it has like those central gateways and for that reason what we have like I mean in this image in this photograph we see this square area this courtyard in the center and which is which also sort of like corresponds with this square area here and then we see the central gateways here this very characteristic gateways which has this Iwan motif but at the top we have this triangular roof and then like I mean the triangular roof also has this like I mean really this sharp triangular apex on the top of it. So this typical architecture that we find here in the Jama Masjid of Srinagar is something that is meticulously studied and then that is depicted in this map shawl here as well. In this case we have those central gateways and then like I mean of course like I mean how this the central tower with this long triangular uh, apex is depicted there. And then also what we find in the center there is this fountain and this fountain we can also relate it to the Chaharbagh plan that we find in the Mughal gardens and so on in which we have like I mean this four rivers they would come and sort of like I mean meet at the center. So there are those there we see that I mean there is flow of water here and that sort of like I mean goes to the fountain not all the other ways would have the water sources but it loosely sort of follows this Chaharbagh planning and this fountain is perhaps like I mean depicted here by showing the square area at the center. Now what we also see that I mean it is not just a faithful depiction of this architectural complex in Srinagar but the embroider has also took liberty or the embroiders have also took liberty in terms of like depicting the surface whereas the recognizability of this architectural structure is there when we see the details within this structure we find the zigzag motifs or like I mean the repetitive patterns which are used which sort of like I mean makes us come back to the idea that even though we are looking at a representation of Jama Masjid but this is an embroidered version of it and that's the reason we also need to understand that this is an embroidered surface and it is not just a depiction of the uh, uh, Jama Masjid. So it's kind of like I mean uh, makes the viewer question their um, um, perception about architecture and textile that it um, by, by like I mean inserting these repetitive motifs or the zigzag patterns uh, it's almost like a claim that the shawl makers or the embroiders are making that we are looking at an architectural depiction but nevertheless this is textile and the characters of the textiles that's the reason are also depicted very much in this uh, form. The other thing also we find that there are many other structures around and that's the reason there was a need for sort of emphasizing this particular structure which is distinctive from the other houses or the palace complex and, and stuff so on. And that's the reason there is this area which we find that to be covered with this blue embroidery and blue and black embroidery and that sort of emphasizes its relevance in the surface. So from there what we see that I mean as I have mentioned that I mean if this 
is what is happening in Kashmir, we find that in the Himachal, in the Chamba region, this particular kind of rumals were there that is being used. And those are square format rumals. Usually we see square or slightly rectangularish format rumal. And these are again that even the rumals are something that we use on a daily basis, but these rumals were certainly not used for daily basis. These were either used for gift giving or for dowry or for like religious ceremonies and so on. And in this rumals, what we see that this Dorukha technique is used in which the satin stitch is used in both sides so that it can be seen, the same motifs can be seen in both sides. There is no reverse side and no front side. So both sides can be equally appreciated. And in this rumals, we find that again that there are those close similarities with the figuration and the narratives with the miniature paintings, something that we have already discussed in the context of the Kashmir shawls. But in this case, what we see that on the muslin cloth, silk threads are used for making this embroidery. And this kind of embroidery is something we find that to have been there in the practice at least since 18th century. So we are talking about similar time frame for the Kashmir shawls, for the Pahari miniatures and for the Chamba rumals. And so in this case, we see mostly the Hindu mythological stories, the Hindu epics, Ramayana, Mahabharata and so on, those are depicted. And a lot of themes we will find them to be around the Krishna's life and his activities. And in this case, we find us a narrative from Ramayana in which we see the trio Rama, Sita and Lakshmana, they are wandering in the forest and the forest landscape is depicted here with the varied range of trees and plants around them. So the Chamba Rumals, we find them to have also declined in the early 20th century, something we can also associate with like, I mean, the depiction of Baluchar saris and many other practices during the colonial period. And so when we think about the allied practices with Chamba Rumals, one thing we can see that more than the miniature paintings, we might find it similar to some of the mural paintings. So for example, in the left side of the screen, we have a mural from the Vrijraj Swami temple of Nurpur in Himachal Pradesh, in which we see this flat red background upon which like the event of Krishna's life is being sort of delineated and this narrative flow kind of continues. For the Chamba Rumals also we find that how that is something where the background is not given, I mean the background is not executed but it is the fabric is left there as a background and then the figures are then executed on the top of the fabric. So that is something we find that to be there as a relation between these murals and the textiles whereas the other perhaps like I mean relationship we can find that to be uh, similar with the Fulkari textiles of Punjab in which again like satin stitch is used and these textiles are also used as dowry or gift giving during marriage and other ceremonies but once we see the images on the Fulkari textile like here, these are much more sort of geometric and the depiction of the figures and all those are also like, I mean, they stay close to geometry than being close to the kind of sophistication the Chambarumas would have. So for that reason, most often like the Fulkari textiles are something those are associated with like this idea of so-called folk or community kind of activity. Whereas the murals are something that is associated with much more the courtly practice. And we see the Chamba Rumals are something that is almost between the courtly practices and this folk practices. So where do we situate them? So these are the different kind of questions when we see that there are those allied practices with the craft making and how we sort of associate one with the other. Thank you.